Well, hello again. Um, Stephen Cowan here with uh, Denise Loney, our Managing Director. Um, Denise has enormous uh, experience uh, in the court. Oh, she's laughing there. <laughs> False modesty, <laughs> Denise, but she does. Uh, she has a lot, a lot of experience. Uh, also senior tutor in civil litigation on uh, Glasgow University, I believe. So there's no better person, uh, I think, would be able to describe um, court action um, that can be taken, uh, which would be taken generally in the event of a uh, letter before action uh, having not produced a desired result. So I'm going to ask um, Denise some questions about court procedure. Uh, and the, the first type of court action we're going to be discussing is simple procedure. Now, before we actually get into what simple procedure is, um, I'd like to ask uh, Denise, um, are there any checks, Denise, that you think we should carry out before we start a court action? Yes, absolutely, Stephen. Whatever type of action um, we're looking to raise, we would always want to do a credit check on the um, the debtor uh, to make sure that they are still trading and in the event of a business debt, and that um, we'd also want to carry out insolvency checks to make sure that they weren't already in some sort of insolvency uh, arrangement. Uh, so, in fact, we do that at every stage of the process because things, of course, can change from the point at which you raise an action to maybe several months down the line and you're looking at enforcement. So these checks are carried out regularly throughout the process uh, and it's very important that we do it. Uh, what we also want to do before we even think about raising action is uh, we need to be clear that we're suing the right party. It's, it's surprising um, how if that's if that's a fair word to use, clients can be in terms of their own business setups and they can find that they can, you know, they've got customers of theirs who've run out quite run up quite significant debts. They want us to pursue it, but they're not actually very clear who their customer is. Um, so it's something we would want to be very clear about right from the very start. Who is the debtor? What, is it a limited company? Is it a partnership? Is it a sole trader? Is it an individual? Uh, so that that would be a, a crucial check that we would carry out before we raise action. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I endorse it. I would say that the major reason that legal action is unsuccessful is because the client doesn't know who they're, they've been dealing with. Can I put you on the spot a bit, Denise, if you don't mind? Um, what if you don't know the debtor's business name? I'll just give you an example. Um, you and Kyle, um, actually, you and Kyle used to be a partnership, and then it became a limited company. So let's say I phone up a newspaper. Um, Hi, I'm Stephen Cowan, you and Kyle would like to place an advert. Um, and then I don't pay the bill. What would you do in that situation? Can you just sue you and Kyle the business name? Yes, you can. You can. And, and I think, Stephen, that's something that's perhaps peculiar to Scotland. Um, yeah, you're right. Correct me if I'm wrong. But yes, we can just sue you and Kyle. And if we get to the point where we have a decree or judgment against you and Kyle, we are then able to enforce that against you, Stephen Cowan, if you are the proprietor um, of you and Kyle. Um, if you're the proprietor with others in, a, in some sort of partnership, we can also enforce against them too. OK, well, that's, I think, yes, that has a real advantage that we have in Scotland over England. I I'm obviously very sensitive to that. Um, we are in Scotland, it's just a peculiarity that we have. Um, anyway, now moving to the £5,000 question, what, what actually is simple procedure? So simple procedure is the process in Scotland whereby um, court actions are raised where the amount outstanding is um, a sum up to £5,000. These are actually relatively new rules that come into force in 2016 um, and they replaced two different sets of rules, small claims and, and summary cause, which, which some listeners might remember. Um, the 
the idea of a simple procedure was to try and bring those two um, old procedures together and make things a bit more user friendly. Uh, I think the idea very much was that simple pro procedure could be used by litigants in person um, and that it would be straightforward for members of the public to use. I think simple procedure has absolutely failed in that regard. I think if anything, it's more complicated than any other procedure we have in Scotland. Um, however, in any event, if we are instructed to raise action, then we have to prepare a claim form um, and the claim form is prescribed and, and set out under the simple procedure rules. We have to populate that claim form um, and it includes the information that you would probably expect it to include, details of who the parties are, details of the sum outstanding, why it's outstanding. Um, so we need we need to understand a bit about a trading relationship or goods or services that, that have been um, supplied. It's up to us uh, to determine which court the action should be raised in. Um, and that's normally fairly straightforward for us. Probably um, relevant just to say that in terms of selecting that court, the jurisdiction rules in Scotland are exactly the same as the jurisdiction rules for the rest of the UK. Um, so we would normally be raising action either based on domicile of the uh, respondent, as, as they're called under simple procedure, um, or place of performance of the contract that we're suing under. Denise, that's a brilliant answer. Textbook answer. Well done. I can see why you're senior tutor at the university. Anyway, you've drafted the claim form. You've explained what you need to do. But how do you submit that to the court? So it's probably one of the very few examples where the recent pandemic has been a good thing. Um, because as a result of, as we all know, the world shutting down, the Scottish government and Scottish courts in particular had to get their act together very quickly to allow um, administration of justice to continue. So we now eventually in Scotland have an online capability for raising simple procedure actions. Um, the Scottish civil courts have a portal and once we have completed the claim form, it is submitted via that portal. Um, so that's all good insofar as it goes. What's probably relevant to say is that unlike elsewhere in the UK, uh, where once actions are, are submitted online, there's a, it's a bulk processing claim centre and everything's dealt with there. In Scotland, once it's submitted online, um, it travels down the line to the particular share of court that we're raising the action in. So while it's more efficient at the point when you're raising um, efficiency thereafter depends on which particular share of court that it's going to. And you can imagine, Stephen, that if your action is being raised in Glasgow share of court, which is, I believe, still the busiest court in Europe, um, there's a big team of people there and things are being processed very quickly. But if you're raising in Loch Maddy share of court up in the Western Isles, which maybe only sits for two mornings a month, then it's going to take a bit longer. Um, the only other thing I would say about raising is that obviously a court fee has to be paid at the, at the point of raising, and that court fee um, varies depending on the amount of the claim. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree with you, Denise. I think actually this was an opportunity lost. Um, and I confess that despite my having done this job for many, many years, I don't think I've ever raised the court action in Loch Maddy Shed of Court. You obviously have. Uh, uh -huh. um, yeah. But it's good to know that it travels down the portal all the way up to Loch Maddy. That, that's encouraging to know. Um, so once the claim is registered, what does the court do? So under simple procedure, Stephen, uh, the court, once they've checked the claim and made sure the fee's been paid, etc., um, the, the court will issue uh, what we refer to as the timetable. And the timetable has two dates on it. The first is the last date by which service has to be made on the respondent. And the second is the last date by which the respondent has to respond if the respondent's going to. 
So the last date for service is probably fairly self-explanatory. That is the date by which we have to have the claim served on the respondent. Now, in Scotland, um, unlike elsewhere in the UK, we have to submit evidence of service to the court. So we first of all, we try and serve the claim form by way of recorded delivery post. Uh, if that's effective, great. Um, uh, and we check it's effective by tracking it on the Royal Mail website. If it is not effective, then we have to pass the claim form to sheriff officers and ask them to effect personal service. Now, sheriff officers, as you know, are akin to or a hybrid maybe of bailiffs and, and high court enforcement officers elsewhere in the UK. Now, you might ask, gosh, well, what happens if you go through all that process, but you're 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 running up very close to the last date for service? Um, that's not a problem. Um, it, it, if we're having trouble serving the claim, we can go back to the court at any point and ask the court to issue us with a new timetable just by explaining that we're, we're having challenges, challenges serving the claim. Uh, once we have served the claim uh, and we have to upload evidence of that um, to the court, we then sit tight for the second date to come along, which is the last date for response. Now, that's the date by which the respondent has to tell us and the court if they're wanting to dispute the claim. So we have to, to let that date come and go, if you like. Um, and normally the day after the last date for response, if we haven't heard from the respondent, we then just check in with the court to make sure nothing's been lodged and we can then move the the court action along to the next stage. Uh, OK, um, Denise, there's a, a great deal of detail in, th in that answer. Um, but let me ask another question. Um, what, when you're talking about, you know, there's the timetable. You've explained that very well. But when, what dates rather are you likely to be given by the courts with regards to the timetable? So that, that's a good question and that varies hugely. Just going back to my example between looking at Glasgow Sheriff Court and Loch Maddy Sheriff Court. Um, generally speaking, the last date for service would be somewhere between four and six weeks hence for, from the point that you're raising the action. And the last date for response would be a minimum of 14 days after that date sometimes a bit longer. Um, now, in Glasgow, for example, those dates, you can pretty much rely on um, those dates being fixed. Going back to um, Loch Maddy, who's getting a bit of a hard time, um, the, the, those timescales are likely to be much more elastic. Yeah, I mean, the point that you raised about evidence of service by recorded delivery post actually has been litigated on uh, quite seriously in Scotland. Um, I mean, we're not going to go into that in the podcast uh, because it's far too detailed. Um, and if you want to fall asleep, that's one sure way of being able to fall asleep. But being serious uh, again for a moment, why would you not go straight to a sheriff officer and ask them to serve the claim form rather than attempting service by the court of delivery post? Very simple answer to that question. Um, it's, it's, it's a matter of cost. Um, if you have tried record delivery post first and it fails um, and you then have to instruct sheriff officers, then your sheriff officer's fee is recoverable as an expense um, from the respondent. If you go straight to sheriff officer, which you're entitled to do, um, then it's very unlikely you will be able to recover that cost. OK, that's uh, it's all about the money. I think, yeah, that's, all about the money. I, I think that's a very good answer. Um, so let's look at it from the respondent's um, perspective. Um, what does the response form uh, entitle the respondent to do? So the post service, the, the, the respondent can, um, well, do nothing, I suppose, is, is the first thing. And that, that does happen where um, respondents bury their heads for, for whatever uh, reason. Uh, the respondent can also admit the claim um, and then make arrangements to settle 
the, 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 the sun that's been claimed. And I mean, that happens reasonably often. Um, the respondent can also admit the claim, but where the respondent doesn't have the funds to pay, um, and uh, so long as it is an individual respondent, they can ask for time to pay, um, and, that, and that's done through a, a, a formal court process. And then lastly, the respondent can dispute the claim. Yeah, um, thanks. I think that summarises the position very well. I mean, for those of you who are listening, uh, which by definition you are, um, we will be doing a podcast on judgment enforcement, which will include time to pay. So we will uh, revisit that. Uh, so let's assume, uh, Denise, that um, the, the claimant's in a position that they actually want to get, in England you'd call it a judgment, in Scotland for uh, smaller value actions, we used to call it a decree. I, I believe we call it a decision uh, for simple procedure actions. Can you explain how we get the decision? So after the last date for response that I mentioned earlier has come and gone, and we've carried out a check with the court just to make sure that no response has been lodged, um, we then have, we then apply for the decision, and we have to do that within fourteen days of the last date for response. So, so we need to be on it. We need to done that check, and we need to have the application ready. Um, that's submitted through the, the the portal that we mentioned earlier, and once received by the court, they would then just check that we've complied with the process and the rules, and if the court's happy that we have then uh, they would prepare the decision and issue it to us. Now, we normally would expect to get that within two to four weeks um, of applying for it. Uh, one important thing to say under simple procedure is that once we have the decision, we actually can't do anything with it for a period of 28 days under the simple procedure rules. What we normally do in practice is we let the respondent know at that point we've got the decision and we invite them to, to contact us and to try and resolve matters. But we have to sit tight for that period once we have the decision. Yeah, I think I think it's fair to say, Denise, that the whole process from starting the court action to actually getting the decision can take some time. Um, probably longer than most English um, litigants um, are used to. But as we'll see if, in further uh, podcasts, it is swings and roundabouts. Um, there are some distinct advantages, in, but I think in, in Scottish procedure, certainly when it comes to enforcement, which we'll discuss later. But I mean, this, I think, there is a frustration about the length of time this takes. There is, Stephen, and I think counterintuitively, it's actually quicker for bigger debts in Scotland, assuming the action is not defended, but for actions where the debt is over £5,000, we will generally have a decree very much quicker than we will under some similar yeah. procedure where the amounts are smaller. And that doesn't really seem to make sense to me, but that's that's the way it is. Um, yeah, we'll cover that when we look at ordinary procedure, but you're absolutely correct about that. And and the last question on that I'd like to ask you about simple procedure. What about representation? Do, does the claimant need to have a lawyer or can they um, represent themselves? So this is more um, relevant if the claim is disputed. Yes, yes. Um, so again, as I said right at the start, the, the simple procedure was designed so that um, individuals and parties could represent themselves. Um, and in theory, I think that is actually quite difficult to do, but it it does happen. So so no, it, you, you do not need to instruct a solicitor. And um, if you sit in any simple procedure course, you'll see this. it's probably roughly 50-50 between um, cases where there are lawyers instructed and cases where parties are trying to do it themselves. Well, thanks very much, Denise. I think that's a good whistle-stop tour of simple procedure. Thank thanks you, Stephen. Again.